Let's open to Matthew chapter 2. Verse number 19 is where we're going to begin in just a few more moments. It's going to be about the death of Herod. But I want us to go back to the writings of Josephus and glean some more of the background information for what changes in Judea uh, with the death of Herod. And so that involves talking about Herod himself. We already know uh, that he is in horrendous health. Uh, He's 70 years of age, but uh, he has suddenly developed all sorts of physical problems. Uh, He's got this constant fever, lots of itching all over his body. He's got pain in his gut. He's got swelling in his feet. He apparently has some sort of parasitical infection uh, where bugs are actually, worms are actually uh, seen uh, coming out of his rectum, uh, and he can hardly breathe. Uh, The more religious people are saying that this is because of what he did to the two rabbis and the 40 students of theirs that chopped down the golden eagle uh, on the gate between the woman's court and the court of the priests. Well, he went to Jericho because it's warmer there, and then he went across the Jordan Valley to the other side of the Dead Sea to a place called Calero because it's got uh, hot springs, mineral springs, which are supposed to be good for what ails you. So he spends a little bit of time there. Uh, But then he decides to come back to Jericho, which is where he will be when he dies. And this is where we definitely see uh, the crazy, murderous man uh, that we see in Scripture. And so this is from uh, The Wars of the Jews by Josephus, Uh, Book 1, chapter 23. He then returned back and came to Jericho in such a melancholy state of body as almost threatened him with present death. And when he proceeded to attempt a horrid wickedness, for he got together the most illustrious men of the whole Jewish nation out of every village into a place called Hippodrome and there shut them in. All right, let me break into it. He basically sends out an order. I want Every, I want every Jewish leader of every community from the entire kingdom to be brought to the Hippodrome, the horse racing track at Jericho, which would have been a big venue. And he wants them confined there like an internment camp. Now back to the quote. He then called for his sister Salome and her husband Alexis and made this speech to them. Quote, I know well enough that the Jews will keep a festival upon my death. However, it is in my power to be mourned for on other accounts and to have a splendid funeral if you will but be subservient to my commands. Do you but take care to send soldiers to encompass these men that are now in custody and slay them immediately upon my death and then all Judea and every family of them will weep at it, whether they will or no. So Herod basically says, I want that entire hippodrome of leaders from around my kingdom to be executed the moment I quit breathing, because I will have tears on the day that I die. Now that's a crazy man. Uh, Now around this same time, the expected letter from Caesar Caesar Augustus arrived, which gave Herod permission to either execute or banish his son Antipater. Remember, he's the 40-something-year-old son that has been condemned for attempted patricide, the killing of his dad. Uh, He had been the heir to the throne, but now he's just a man awaiting execution. Now, Herod, Herod excuse me, uh, 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 Augustus Caesar 
has never been happy <laughs> with some of this paranoia of, um, of Herod. Uh, Augustus Caesar has actually been like the uncle, uh, the, the adopted uncle of most of Herod's boys. Uh, they have gone to Rome and lived in the palace and studied uh, underneath the, uh, the tutors that work in the palace for Augustus Caesar. And so Antipater has also known Caesar very well. Uh, and so Caesar tells Herod, look, I know you want to execute him, but you know, you can also have my permission to just simply banish him from your kingdom. So uh, during this time, um, after getting this letter, Herod has a really bad fit of coughing. I mean, really goes at it and apparently decides that he's going to kill himself instead of just dragging on. So he takes a paring knife that he had traditionally used to cut up his own apples to eat. Uh, and he was going to either stab himself or slit his wrists or something. And uh, one of his cousins who was trying to help him out sees that this was his intention. So he grabs him and won't let him do this. And uh, everybody starts crying and sobbing because... You know, the people closest to Herod, they don't like this idea that he would kill himself. Well, that noise going on in the residential area can be heard all the way down into the jail area, the detention area under the palace. And Antipater immediately assumed that his dad was dead, and that's what everybody was crying about. And so he tells the jailer, look, look. Just let me out of here now, and I'll pay you big bucks. Well, the jailer apparently has his allegiance for King Herod because it gets reported back to King Herod, who's not dead. And so Herod says, I want that son dead now. That was the last straw for him. So he has Antipater executed. Then he sits down and changes his will into its final form. And I want to go over that with you because it's, I think, interesting historically. He decides that his son Archelaus, who is only 18 years of age, should be declared the next king of the Jews. Now, that's a change from his last will. He'd skipped over Archelaus the last time. So, next, Herod Philip, who's 17... He wanted him to be declared the Tetrarch of Iturea, Golanitis, which that's the Golan, Trachonitis, and Peneus. Peneus is Caesarea Philippi, as we know it. So this is all areas up by the Sea of Galilee. And then he wanted Herod Antipas to be declared, and by the way, he's 15 at this time, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. And uh, Philip and Antipas are actually both going to be in those positions in the New Testament later, uh, and that's where we'll talk about them. Uh, then he wanted a thousand talents. Uh, that's the equivalent of 10 million days wages. So we are talking about over a billion dollars worth of buying power. He wants a thousand talents to be given to Caesar Augustus. So this helps you understand how filthy rich Herod the Great was, why he was such a powerful force uh, in the Roman Empire. Then he wants half that amount, 500 talents, uh, to be designated to Augustus's wife, Julius, and to their children and to various friends and freemen in the royal household at Rome, because Herod is personal friends with Augustus Caesar and with all the members of the household. Uh, so we're already accounting for a couple of billion dollars worth uh, of uh, money going uh, to people at Rome out of Herod's uh, will. Fifty talents uh, were to be designated to his sister Salome, 
Now, at this point, that doesn't sound like an awful amount, uh, awful lot amount, but that's several tens of millions of dollars. It's, it's almost $75 million worth of buying power. Uh, and uh, then he also gave Salome key control over some s- cities in Judea. And then finally, he bequ- bequeathed several other large amounts of money to his various kids, uh, including daughters. And uh, that's the will that will be sent to Augustus Caesar as the executor to decide whether or not he agrees with all of these conditions. And so then, five days after he'd executed Antipater, Herod died. And Salome and Alexis immediately released all those people that were in the Hippodrome before they even announced the death of Herod because there was no way in the world that they were going to be uh, involved in such an atrocity. Uh, Now, before heading off to Rome in order to be confirmed by Augustus Caesar as king of the Jews, according to the the document that we were just talking about, the will, Archelaus, uh, this 17-year-old son, uh, orchestrated a grand funeral for his father. Uh, And uh, during the seven-day mourning period, he provided a funeral meal for the entire population of Jerusalem. So basically, you know how when we have our Uh, funerals nowadays, it's kind of traditional for there to be a funeral dinner for the family and close friends, uh, usually at the church or someplace close by. Well, he decides to throw a funeral dinner like that for the entire population of Jerusalem. We're talking about many hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, So he's got a lot of money as well. Uh, And uh, he also... um, acceded to the requests that were being made to him as the presumptive heir to the throne to reduce taxes and import export tariffs and to release certain political prison prisoners that his father had arrested. And uh, so he figures that's a good thing to do to get off on the right foot with the people. So he agrees to all of those sorts of things. Uh, now, uh, the funeral procession for King Herod, started at Jericho, and then went up to a place called Herodium, which is a little bit south and uh, east of the city of Bethlehem. Our last trip to um, Israel, this last March, we went to the city of Herodium, which is in the Palestinian Authority area, uh, and saw the place where Herod was laid to rest. Uh, on a previous trip, uh, um, went to the Jerusalem Museum, and you can actually see the coffin uh, for Herod uh, that's held in the museum now. So all of those special things uh, Archelaus is trying to do on behalf of his dad before he goes down to Caesarea, jumps on a boat, and heads off to Rome. Uh, So after the seven days of public mourning was over, so we're now talking about being probably moving into April, some of the Jews began to demonstrate for the punishment of those that had assisted Herod in executing the men who had torn down the Golden Eagle. So they want reprisals. Uh, They also demanded the replacement of that last high priest by King Herod. Uh, These demonstrations continued right up into Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we know exactly when all this happened. Uh, So that's taught, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was taking place from uh, effectively 11 April till 18 April of 4 B.C., Archelaus first tried to uh, diplomatically tell the protesters no. But the crowd started throwing stones at his representatives. So he sends out a military tribune with 600 troopers. Now, these were not necessarily Roman soldiers, although he might have had some Roman soldiers in his kingdom 
Uh, these may have been uh, Jewish or perhaps uh, other Middle Eastern uh, persons that are working for him. So he sends out this troop to try to scare the crowd, but uh, they stoned them too and actually killed several soldiers and ended up seriously wounding the tribune that was in charge of this military unit. So Archelaus decided enough was enough. So he basically sent his soldiers into the crowd and 3,000 protesters were killed uh, in this direct action and in the stampede that happened uh, after it. Remember, Jerusalem was always jam-packed with people uh, during uh, Passover time. Uh, probably up to a million people were milling in and around uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and around the cities nearby uh, during the festivals. And so um, a thousand people, 3,000 people killed thanks to Archelaus' actions. And then he headed off to Rome. Uh, now, it is probably best at this point to take up the story in Matthew 2.19 because it talks about Herod's death and what immediately happened in the story of Mary and Joseph thereafter. So let's read it. It says, when Herod died, so that would be March uh, or maybe early April of 4 BC, behold, an angel of he who is, the Lord, appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So that very night, before any messages, could have come by human means to wherever they're at in Egypt. Uh, he finds out immediately that Herod is dead. Verse 2, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. So within a matter of days after Herod is dead, uh, probably during the time that all of the uh, mourning ceremonies are taking place in Jerusalem, uh, Joseph packs up all their belongings and takes Mary, uh, takes Mary and uh, young Jesus, who is uh, now no doubt uh, talking quite well because uh, he's uh, a few months older, uh, and heads off to the land of, e of Israel. Now, it's going to take several days for them to travel to uh, Israel. And they probably arrive right after the Passover disaster, uh, when 3,000 people were killed uh, because of Archelaus's uh, response to the protesters. And so that is why it makes perfect sense what we read next, verse 22. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So he was probably planning on going back to Bethlehem because that's where they left. They had a house there. Uh, and live there. But instead, now he's thinking about it. Wow, bad things are happening. This this Archelaus, remember, he's Archelaus is only 17 years of age, so he's only probably a couple of years younger than Joseph, at the most. Uh, he's thinking, man, this is, this is not good. I'm not so sure I want to go back to Bethlehem. And so he has a night's sleep, and as has happened every other time, God communicates to him in a dream. So being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So Joseph bypasses Judea and goes back to Galilee, specifically to Nazareth, because that's what he knows, and takes up residence there which prompts Matthew to tell us about another fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 23, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. Now, that's built on a Hebrew word, netzer, with a plural ending on it, 
ot, which has to do with more than one. Uh, so a netzer is a sprig that grows up from a stump. So, you know, you've cut off a tree before, probably, trying to get rid of it. And uh, if you don't grind it out, if you don't poison it, pretty soon you got little sprouts popping out from it. And so that's what netzer means in Hebrew. It's usually translated in our English as branch. Well, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 11, there is a prophecy relating to the coming of the Messiah, that he is going to be the branch. And this is not the only place that this prophecy occurs. There's other places where basically the stump of David's kingdom, you know, where God cut it off because of sin, it's going to sprout a brand new sprig, a new branch that's going to become the eternal king, this son of David, this Messiah. And so uh, Jesus' family takes up residence in a town in Galilee that's called Branches, using the Hebrew word for branch. And so Matthew says that was to that was what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. So Jesus ends up being called by the name of the town that he lives in. So he ends up being called, hey, Branches, because he comes from the town of Branches. And so this is that that I think is a little bit of a sense of humor of God. It's certainly the irony of God uh, that he is even fulfilling uh, the prophecies of old by the name of the town that he, that he grows up into adulthood in. Uh, so we're going to leave Jesus and his parents in Nazareth, setting up their household there again, and finish up with a little bit more of Archelaus. Um, you, he jumps on a boat in April of 4 BC and heads off to Rome. Right behind him, his younger brother Antipas, the 15-year-old, the uh, is coming to petition that he should actually be the king of the Jews because that was his father's previous intention in the last will. Uh, and uh, this Antipas is being uh, backed up by his... Uh, his aunt Salome in that, and she goes to Rome with him. There is another Jewish delegation uh, that heads off to Rome at this same time. They don't want Archelaus to be in charge of the kingdom. Uh, instead, they want the Jewish kingdom of Herod to be absorbed into the Roman province of Syria. They just want the Jewish territories to be part of the Roman Syria in the eastern end of the uh, Mediterranean basin. They, want, uh, they don't want to have a king over them anymore. They want to go back to uh, basically being ruled by the Sanhedrin and the various members of the Sanhedrin scattered all over uh, the region of the Jews. Now, um, that's not the way Augustus goes. Um, Augustus uh, decides to declare uh, Archelaus not king of the Jews, but rather ethnarch of the Jews. But he promises him that if he will do a good job, then uh, he will be declared king of the Jews later. And so this is how things settle down uh, at the end of 4 BC. Uh, and when um, Archelaus gets back uh, to Jerusalem in 3 BC, uh, he's got some cleanup to do because the riots continued while he was gone. Uh, and so he ends up uh, replacing the high priest again, uh, because he figures a high priest that can't keep the peace must not be in a good, doing a good job. Uh, and then he settles down as pretty much a tyrant. 
Remember, he's 17 when he becomes the ethnarch of the Jews. He's not got an awful lot of practical experience. And so he seems to resort to force every single chance he gets to make people do what he wants them to do. And that is what seals his fate of being removed from this position in 6 AD. Uh, And uh, this will be done by Augustus Caesar himself. So we'll kind of mark our place historically at that juncture, and we'll come back and set a little bit more of the stage for the gospel story the next time we get into God's Word.